Hey everybody, this is a nominee, Questionable Movies, uh, and I'm I'm your uh, I'm your co-host Daniel Levine, and I'm the other co-host Ron Bloom. And today we've got uh, kind of like if if this were Major League Baseball, this would be the All Star Game. We got two, <laughs> we, we had three of my favorite people on the podcast. Uh, <laughs> some of you may be familiar with Ron. He's the he he currently shares the Guinness World Record for most appearances on the Anomaly Questionable Movies podcast. <laughs> we also have uh, coming to us from Amsterdam, Matt Cornell of the Cinema of the Damned, and uh, many many other things. He's written some great essays on I everything from ISIS cats to uh, you know things I haven't read, and uh, he's got an incredible letterbox account. And uh, we also have Carl Rowlison, who has written a lot of biographies. Uh, he, uh, I believe, are, are you still teaching at Baruch, or are you? No, I'm retired. I'm a okay. has been. <laughs> so he's uh, he he used to be a a professor. Well, I mean, you you still have the professor title, right? You you get to keep that, but you're like yeah yeah. You you could see I used to play a professor. <laughs> Right, he he used to play a professor in in my twenties, and uh, today we're we're going to be talking about uh, Marilyn Monroe, specifically the movie Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. But if you're familiar with the show, you're familiar how this uh, this all tends to happen. We're probably going to end up in a lot of places where uh, you don't expect, we don't expect, and uh, uh, hope hopefully you uh, you pack the sandwich. So it's uh, great to have you guys on the program. Thank, Thank you. you so uh, I guess, uh, Ryan, you, you, you want to start this off? Sure. So we've all uh, watched uh, at least one Marilyn Monroe movie, Gentlemen mm. Prefer Blondes, which you know, is starting focus. Um, but so, Carl, you've written about Marilyn Monroe. And Matt and I, a few months ago, watched every single Marilyn Monroe movie oh. in existence including one in which you only see her shoulder. Um, and one where we could never verify that she was in the film, right? That's true. We were looking for a dress. We were looking to see if uh, someone in a green dress, whether or not that was Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> but I don't know. I, Matt, I can't speak for you, but I definitely know that I am not a Marilyn Monroe expert, even watch, after watching all that and watching uh, a documentary or two, a really bad documentary. Um, and then another kind of fictionalized account. So let's start off talking about her image and the image that she conveys in Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. Um, I don't know, how would you describe it? And is it real? Anyone? <laughs> <laughs> well, the first thing I would say uh, about Marilyn Monroe and Gentlemen Prefer Blondes in terms of the, the role that she's playing is she, she is a kind of child woman. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I described this uh, in one of my books, an essay about her. Um, when I was working in my Marilyn Monroe biography in the 1980s, I went to a, a community theater uh, that specialized in showing old movies, and they advertised that they were going to show Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. I had not been to this theater before. It was in a suburban Detroit community when I was then teaching at Wayne State University. And I was a little surprised, this was in the 1980s, uh, that uh, families came. It, it wasn't uh, 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 an older audience at all. It was, it was mainly uh, young adults and families, which kind of surprised me. Uh, and once we, once we got into it, once the, when you, I think you can learn a lot from movies uh, when you see them you know, with an audience and, and gauging their reactions and so on. And uh, the thing that really impressed me and that I later wrote about is how much the children enjoyed the movie. And uh, there were certain scenes where you could see why. There's a boy in the movie, Henry Spofford, who, a young actor playing Henry Spofford III, uh, who has this deep voice and speaks like an adult. Mm -hmm. And when he speaks to Marilyn, she's, she's clearly the child. Uh, and, they, and the kids got just you know, a tremendous bang out of that. So you've got that going as long as, as well, of course, as the, the sexuality, the sex goddess and, and all the rest of it, which is, which is sort of played for last in the film. Mm -hmm. So I think that's certainly a part of what's happening uh, in the film. Yeah, maybe a, a, 
I'll, I'll chime in here and say that I was one of those kids in the audience because my introduction, <laughs> my introduction to Marilyn Monroe was, yeah, I think in the early uh, or mid 1980s when I would have been maybe a freshman in high school, maybe in ninth grade even. And my parents took me to the Castro Cinema in San Francisco uh, for a double feature of Gentlemen Prefer Blondes and Some Like and Hot. And if you know anything about the Castro Cinema, it's in San Francisco's uh, uh, yeah, historical gay district. So the audience was mostly gay. And my understanding of the movie, like uh, with that audience, was first of all that it was like a hugely popular movie with queer audiences and that um, a lot of, oh, we were to understand a lot of the humor and a lot of what was going on in the movie as being sort of extra textual. In other words, Marilyn Monroe was playing a character but she was also always winking to the audience. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I understood that almost immediately just by how it was being received, right? Um, and of course, also as a teenage boy, I fell in love with Marilyn Monroe. I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but also Jane Russell, I have to say, like both of them, uh, you know, they were sort of like the Betty and Veronica of classic Hollywood for me. Yeah, I was, was going to say, I, I think I figured out watching it again last night that I'm not a gentleman because I prefer Jane Russell, but. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not gay. But I have to say that the, the movie that struck a chord with me and the only one I remember seeing as a, as a, a, a child uh, was Some Like It Hot, which was released in 1959. And uh, I was born in 1948. So I was still quite young when I saw the movie. And I think that one of the things that appealed to me, and I'm sort of speculating now because I really don't know, I, I remember enjoying the movie, but this whole performative aspect, this dressing up, uh, in women's clothes appealed to me because I, I start out by saying I'm not gay because even though that's true, uh, I had a, a best friend next door, a male friend, and we enjoyed dressing up in women's clothes. Uh, I don't know if we want to get into that too much, but, but, but that film really appealed to me to see these adult men doing the same thing that, that the kids did. And, and at the time, we, we didn't do it as some kind of secret shameful thing, you know, and, I took out some of my grandmother's clothes and we just thought it was a funny thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this idea of, of, uh, of role playing uh, is certainly a large, a large part of, I think, her appeal because she does it so well. Yeah, I would agree with that. The only thing that I would say that distinguishes those two movies is that I think that in Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, you really get the sense that her character, Lorelei, has sort of the upper hand and I think, unfortunately, as much as I love Some Like It Hot, I think that her character in that is more, is is not sort of uh, winking to the audience in the same way. I mean, she's actually the one who's sort of being taken for a ride and she's uh, kind of more stereotypical bimbo in that sense. She does not, you know, she can't, can't see what is obvious to the rest of us. Um, and, and so, and I know that she was not a huge fan of that movie. I think she was- No, no she wasn't, that's that right. Movie, yeah. Really, but yeah, I, mean, I love both pathos. movies. But, yeah, there's a pathos in that role in *Something Like a Hot*. I think that that uh, uh, is, you know, maybe people read it. Maybe I read into it because knowing about her biography. But there is a kind of sadness there, and and um, when she's in the on the train talking to Tony Curtis, and she talks about this repetitive behavior, the character, you know, that it's happening to her over and over again, men taking advantage of her. Yeah, it's a very different film, very, very different feel to it, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. So I know I started this off um, asking about her image and all that. Now we do what we always do is after the discussion, uh, we talk about, you know, oh, what's the movie about? So would anybody like to uh, actually summarize the movie for our audience who very good chance they haven't seen it? Well, of course, it's based on a, a famous novel by Anita Luce. Uh, gentlemen prefer blondes, uh, and the, the blonde is obviously Marilyn Monroe. Dorothy, played by Jane Russell, there's there's a character called Dorothy in the novel as well, who, who plays, in a sense, the role of, of the adult. Uh, Lorelai is a kind of uh, gold digger, I suppose you would say, played with, you know, in the movie, with such sweetness by Marilyn Monroe that I don't think anyone really condemns her very much. Uh, so they're, so she's got this rich boyfriend, they're on the Ile de France, uh, the, you know, the, the, there's a father who objects to the, 
the son marrying this gold digger, Marilyn Monroe. Uh, Jane Russell is uh, playing Dorothy, looking out for Lorelei and trying to explain to her, you know, the realities of things. Uh, there's a curious moment in the film uh, when um, the Marilyn Monroe character, Lorelei, is confronted by uh, her um, fiance's uh, father, who's, who's very skeptical. Uh, and, you know, he says at one point when he's talking to her, he says, uh, they say, they say you're stupid, something like that. They, they, I thought you were stupid. And she says, I can be smart when I want to be. And then again, it goes back to this sense of, you know, role playing. To what extent is, is Lorelei actually dumb? Uh, right, a right. lot of what happens in general, but for, for her blondes also, I think, has a lot to do with the director, Howard Hawks, and his conception of the film and what he thought Marilyn Monroe was capable of doing. He, he didn't really have all that much respect for her. I can say more about that if people are curious, but I, I think he, he, he saw her um, as an actress of limited capacity who, who could do that kind of role. I, I see her quite differently from Hawks, but I think that's, that's part of the nature of what's happening in the film. And needless to say, you know, she, she gets her, you know, the Lorelei gets her guy you know, there's a great scene in the film with Jane Russell with a bunch of Olympic ath athletes, a real sort of male party there that she's a part I mean, of, too. All like wearing uh, not nudie suits, but like uh, like skin tone. Yeah. Sports. It's like pretty racy for 1954. I, I can report that that, that sequence, uh, Jane Russell singing, Is There Anyone Here for Love, uh, while surrounded by all these um, male Olympians. This this scene was the most popular one at the Castro Theater. And <laughs> yeah, like and then of course you know years later when I started reading about this movie, of course this is widely interpreted as one of the few movies, especially for that time, to have something like a female gaze, right? Mm. In that Jane Russell is clearly uh, erotic. You know those men are looked at in an erotic way, mm. but I also think there's another female gaze in the movie which is quite literally, uh, so, you know, I mean, Jane Russell's is clearly a lusty one, right? She, she's looking at all these men. I mean, the script says it's about love, but it's clearly about sex for her. And then for Marilyn, it's clearly about material comfort and wealth. So at one point, there's this great shot where she looks at Lord Beekman, Piggy, and his <laughs> head turns into a diamond. And then, you know, so like, I think it's, it's really funny that they both, you know, the movie is largely through their perspective, uh, and it's largely about what they can get from men, right? Uh, in this uh, in this very self interested way that is pretty subversive in a movie from this time period, I think. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, mm. you and think I mean, we, we we programmed the film at uh, at at our theater, Cinema of the Damned, as part of a series of movies called Marrying Up, and mm. it was this idea that you can look at a lot of older films to see somewhat subversive ideas about the idea of uh, marriage and romantic love. And probably I think the most subversive idea in Gentlemen Prefer Blondes is, uh, is that women are not necessarily, uh, you know, uh, swept up in the idea of, or, or shouldn't necessarily be swept up in the idea of romantic love. And I think it's, it's uh, Lorelei's practicality that's so interesting, right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah. Do you think, I don't know if it's to Howard Hawks credit or to the, to the screenwriters or, or whoever, that they may not have had the 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 phrase male or female gaze you know available to them but do you think that was intentional that they were doing something like that that was that was well that was subversive that we see it now but do you think they were they were aware of it at the time that they were doing it boy that's hard to say um, I don't see Hawks having that kind of motivation to do that in the film even if it's in the film uh, being aware of that um, uh, Monroe is quite aware of obviously the male gaze uh, and uh, the whole issue of manipulating men and not being, you know, all that thrilled um, by the system in which she finds herself. Mm -hmm. um, she had just come out of um, a collaboration with Ben Hecht, not in a movie, but in, in doing uh, an autobiography called My Story. And uh, she, it's, it's really quite a remarkable piece of work. A lot of what Ben Heck did was remarkable, 
uh, one of the things he did was call up Sidney Skolsky, a Hollywood columnist. Um, I mentioned this in my, my biography of Marilyn Monroe, actually in the acknowledgments. Uh, and Hecht read over the phone to um, Skolsky, to this commerce, you know, um, he's telling him, I'm working with Marilyn and here's what she's saying. And I'm trying to capture her voice because Monroe didn't actually write the book. And sort of an asked told to book. Uh, and Skolsky was reassuring him, yeah, that's exactly what she's like. And in that, in that book, she, she presents a kind of um, uh, cynical view. It was really a, a curious thing. I mean, it was never finished. She married DiMaggio and he said, don't do any more of that mm -hmm. uh, because it, 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 it presented a certain kind of uh, realistic, candid quality that uh, um, is, is, doesn't appear in, in her films very much. That's kind of a roundabout, you know, quite, you know, answer to your question about what's going on in the film. I think all think, kinds of things go on uh, in films that the makers of them, the nuances certainly, or what it looks like to a later age, they're not aware of. Right. So I think Hawks is, you know, he's doing something for Daryl Zanuck, you know, he tells Daryl Zanuck, you know, uh, you ought to put Marilyn, you know, don't put her in Niagara, or the serious dramatic films. Uh, she's going to do much better in comedy and, and uh, you know, and Zanuck says, gentlemen, for blondes, I mean, can she sing? And Hawk says, of course she can sing. And Zanuck says, well, how do you know that? And he said, well, I heard her in my car. She was singing to the radio. She can sing just fine. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I just want to say that what, what Carl said about Hawks and uh, Monroe is interesting because the the other as to my knowledge the only other movie they did together was monkey business and of course that yes. was earlier in her career but there she was playing a very stereotypical uh yeah bimbo part the secretary whose major purpose in that was to basically get have passes made at her for the entire movie but i do think it's notable and i and again i'm not a historian i don't know a lot about hawks that uh in a lot of his most iconic sort of screwball uh, comedies you have very strong female characters. Yes. Uh, you know, and arguably the, the, the sort of gender power dynamics in something like Bringing Up Baby and to a lesser degree, uh, His Girl Friday. These are movies with very strong female characters that make me think Hawks was at least uh, interested, uh, you know, in, in this theme, uh, whether or not he fully kind of commits to it on a conscious level. I think that's right. He, he wasn't, you know, he, he, the idea of a woman taking the lead, so to speak, at, at certain points in the film wasn't, wasn't going to trouble Hawks at all. He, he does have these strong women characters. I think that's, that's true. And I think that, that certainly is part of what makes uh, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes a, a Hawks film, uh, among other things, for sure. Yeah. yeah, I mean, maybe not even, I mean, taking the upper hand is one thing, but they're, they're like an anarchic presence, right? So like, wherever uh, a Hawks uh, female character goes seems to bring with her a sort of delightful amount of anarchy, you know, uh, without which you really wouldn't have the, you know, uh, any action in the story. Yeah. Right. That, that's kind of a reversal because I feel like uh, female roles in films, it's usually it's supposed to be like the stabilizing mother, or at least, yeah. maybe, you know, statistically, you're going to get a lot more of that than, the female agent of chaos. Yeah, this is really the reversal that happened in romantic comedies with Judd Apatow onward. You get mm -hmm. this, sort of a backlash against feminism too, right? You get the sort of female character who's now a sort of, yeah, a humorless career-oriented person. Right, somebody's going to have to make Seth Rogen wash his ass. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so you can, you can often see much more interesting roles for women in earlier uh, romantic comedies for that reason. Yeah, <laughs> and and I think Carl, you, you were touching on something really interesting that, that I think kind of clarifies part of my because I I always found that Marilyn Monroe makes me kind of uncomfortable if I'm being completely honest. Mm -hmm. Like the the I mean the the kind of child the fact that she's entirely surfaces like you don't necessarily know if it's because she's intensely private or because it was just pressure from the outside to constantly be on as a performer, but you don't get the sense of, you don't get the sense of who she would be outside of the movie the way you get with some 
some actors, actresses, etc. And uh, yeah, and, and I, I think gentlemen prefer blondes. It it goes into that in a really interesting way, in that there is, at the very least, there's the sense of this second layer of motivation under the performance. Although even that doesn't necessarily seem to be touching at some kind of like true self underneath mm -hmm. it. Um, that's interesting. There's there is still something in her performance of Lorelai Angley that's delusive. You know, to what extent you know she is calculating, she is materialistic, she is manipulating, manipulative. Um, she, she but she does it with such sort of naive, innocent joy. Mm. Um, that she's she can't be a femme fatale as she is in Niagara, um, and then you're 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 saying essentially you're saying well what else is there is there something more behind that uh, I think there was I don't think the film can tell us uh, uh, yeah but, I, uh, just like this this complete uh, she she like you don't get the sense that she wants to convey something personal ever. Um, like like a lot of the the when I first saw a few Marilyn Monroe films, the thing that it she immediately reminded me of are like people who went through childhood trauma who put on like a baby voice to avoid conflict in situations, mm -hmm. and I think that's part of what makes me uncomfortable about her performances. Mm -hmm. uh, I think she gets into the personal in, in films like Bus Stop and The Misfits, uh, particularly Bus Stop because mm -hmm. there you you. Um, She's playing an introvert, even though she's a dance hall girl. Uh, all of the gestures are the gestures of an introvert, uh, as opposed to another film like The Prince and the Showgirl, where all, all her gestures, she's playing a similar kind of role in a sense, but all the gestures are extroverted, so extroverted that she practically knocks Olivier off the, sc the screen frame at one point. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's really extraordinary um, what, what she's doing there. Uh, but she wasn't given um, very few directors. Uh, Hawk certainly wasn't interested in in uh, the method or for bringing out something of her own experience in her roles. Uh, it does come out you know, with with him of all people, Henry Hathaway, who wasn't known for that kind of film. But it, it does come out in Niagara. The other thing I, I want to say about Marilyn too in her roles is. Um, yeah, those earlier roles before Gentlemen for Blondes, except for Niagara, where, which is the starring role. The early ones, she's playing the bimbo, the sex, uh, the secretary, the, the the woman that men ogle and so on. And what's curious to me about the 1950s is that role in the late 40s and early 50s, which is meant to be at, at best a supporting role and often just a cameo, the way she walks on, say, in the Marx Brothers picture, The Love Happy. Love happy, uh, just the butt of a joke, essentially. Um, they the studio turns that minor role into the major role mm -hmm. after *Gentlemen for, for Blondes*. Uh, you know, and the epitome of that is the girl uh, in *The Seven Year Itch*. Um, you know, they talk about precursors of Marilyn Monroe. They, you know, names like Gene Harlow are mentioned, but Harlow's movies are nothing like that. Um, yes, there is the sex goddess aspect to it, um, but it's so different, especially in the pre-code period, uh, the kind of Gene Harlow you get that, that is very different from, uh, from Marilyn Monroe or the Marilyn Monroe imitators in the 1950s, a completely different sort of affect in the movie. Right. Yeah, Dan, I would also just say that I think I agree bus stop is one to look at uh, for a little bit more depth, uh, not only because of Marilyn's character that she's playing there, but also because she produced the film and arguably mm. was, you know, was the auteur of the film, like to the extent that there can be an auteur. Um, I, I don't think that, that that film has aged particularly well in some regards, but mm -hmm. I do think it's a really interesting movie to look at. And I also think that in The Misfits, uh, for better and for worse, you get a lot of uh, insight into Marilyn as a person. Yeah, I haven't uh, seen The Misfits in probably 10 years. I, I remember like it's a much more, she gets a lot more meaty kind of dramatic stuff to do. Well, yeah. part of it is because her husband wrote it about her, you know, uh, and <laughs> it's a little unpleasant to think about. I, I know that she wasn't, maybe Carl, you could talk about that, but I know that she wasn't uh, happy about 
the, what, what he She wrote. wasn't. The curious thing about it is, yeah, Arthur Miller wrote it for her. They were then married, although the, the marriage at that point was really disintegrating. Um, the thing that she didn't like, uh, as dramatic as the role was, is she didn't think it was, in a sense, dramatic or tragic enough. Oh. Uh, she thought that, that Arthur Miller let her character off, in a sense, um, uh, and uh, didn't, didn't uh, let me put it another way. He didn't show her ugly side. She had a really ugly side. And it, it came out in the, in the marriage to, to Miller, the kinds of things that she would say to him, um, things that she didn't even believe. That is, you know, she had gay friends. She had no animosity toward gays at all. And yet she would say things like to Miller, why are you wearing that? Those are faggy pants. You know, that kind of thing that just had more to do with her animosity toward him. Uh, and it was a comment on his masculinity, I suppose, but it, it, it was it was brutal. Uh, and at one point, um, she got Norman Rostin, uh, a writer, a poet, friend of Miller's, they went to the University of Michigan together. She, she got uh, Norman Rostin on the phone and Miller was on the other uh, line. And she kept saying to Norman Rostin, why don't you tell Arthur what a bad script this is? Uh, and Rostin didn't want to get into it. You know, he was friends with both of them. And, and so he didn't say that. But the curious thing is, and she was a great reader of scripts. Uh, I, uh, Miller sent the script to, to Elia Kazan. Kazan said, you're, you're of two minds about this female character. I don't think you're leveling with your audience, which was exactly what Marilyn Monroe was trying to tell him. Um, so her whole history as a person and also in the in the film industry um well it's it's just fascinating because of the the limited nature of her roles what what i like to say about her is that you know we praise say an actress like um meryl streep uh, for her range tremendous range use of accents different cultures you name it it seems like meryl streep has tried to do it uh, and on the other hand, you've got Marilyn Monroe with whatever you make of her performances. And I, <laughs> in my biography, I make a great deal of her performances. But there's no gainsaying the fact that there, you know, it's a fairly limited range uh, from Don't Bother to Knock to Clash by Night and the Misfits and Bus Stop. You, you can see she did have a range as an actress. Uh, and my point about that is... Suppose a director, and no one ever actually said this to her in so many words, but suppose a director or a Hollywood producer actually came to her and said, now for the rest of your career, from 52 until you die, uh, you're going to play a, a, within a very limited range. Some people will call you a sex symbol. Some people will call you a sex goddess. And your challenge is to take those very limited roles and that very narrow range and make each of those characters live so that people never forget them. I think that's a hell of a, uh, a challenge to an actress or an actor uh, to have to have to do that. And and that's what tore her apart in part was was trying to bring some realism and some depth to her characters. So that by the time she gets the, to the Misfits, whatever you think of the Misfits, whatever you think of Arthur Miller's script, in a sense, he could do no right. Because she was heaping on him uh, more than a decade's, uh, you know, worth of, of disappointment and frustration, you know, not getting to do Holly Golightly and Breakfast at Tiffany's, you know, not, not, to, not, because uh, Dan was a good friend, he would never cast her in a role. Um, it, it was, it was brutal for her in, in many ways. Uh, and uh she was angry during Gentlemen Prefer Blondes about her salary, about her dressing room, about all sorts of things. I don't see you. I don't think you see that on the screen. She is a trooper. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I also have to say, I do like re regardless of what we think of uh, Miller writing that script and how she felt about it. I do think The Misfits is incredibly insightful. I mean, the way that I, I yeah, read the yeah. film, the way that I read the film is that it's about this woman's very limited options uh in terms of how men treat her so like Clark Gable is definitely uh you know acting as a sort of surrogate father right and then Eli Wallach is sort of like surrogate husband 
and then Montgomery Clift is sort of like surrogate son, but none of them are capable of being like a partner for her. Uh, and that seems to be the very clear through line in that is that uh, none of these is a uh, is giving her what she wants, you know, uh, or what. That's she that's really that's really well said. I think that's 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 the that's the greatness of the film. I, you know, I see flaws in the film, but I think I think you put your finger on what what uh, Miller and and John Huston were trying to get at, uh, and uh, she probably again because of the the baggage she brought with her into the film couldn't couldn't see what you just laid out. Uh, and and she was so angry at Miller at that point that that uh, even if he had been able to articulate it just the way you did right then, she she probably couldn't have absorbed it because of the, the high emotional content of of her her reactions to to film by that point, which you know has a lot to do with why going into her last film something's got to give. You know, such an ironic title. Something did have to give because uh, she just she couldn't go on. Uh, in that in that vein, it was a real problem for her. I think that's interesting. I was trying to do like to to prep for this last night. I was doing what what I call the David Thompson exercise. I was trying to imagine <laughs> like what movie that she wasn't in would I have liked to have most seen her in <laughs> if, she, if she'd survived. I, I added that caveat, so it was I, I was just like only movies after 1964 or whatever. And the one that I, I most thought she would be interesting in was Gene Bielman, mm -hmm. right? Because it's that movie, it's a movie about just like having to do the same thing repeatedly and then snap. Mm. Well, I mean, yeah. it's about some other stuff too. It's it's a you know it's about cooking and well, I don't know if it's really about cooking. There's a lot of cooking. I think it yeah, just a Chantal Ackerman Marilyn Monroe collaboration would is is fun to think about in general, whether it's that movie or another one. And I think had she lived, she would have taken on, like if she had lived uh, to the new Hollywood period, she would have taken on really unusual roles, I think. I think she would have teamed up with some of these uh, directors who were trying interesting stuff, you know? I mean, it, she, she really would have probably uh, tried, seen some freedoms in, in, in the early 70s had she, had she been around for it. Yeah, I think uh, had she lived longer, um... She might have had some of those opportunities that that were that were close to her. She was, you know, you mentioned uh, her, you know, essentially uh, being part of the, the production, really, of uh, Bus Stop. Uh, and she, like a lot of actors, was, you know, the old Hollywood was crumbling, and uh, there was a Marilyn Monroe Productions. There wasn't. There was the, just the beginning of an effort. Or what if she had gone to Europe? had a chance to to play in some roles there uh as long as it wasn't barbarella uh, <laughs> uh she she that that might have made a difference too um we haven't said a lot about jane russell uh, no i was uh, thinking about that yeah yeah well, the mean, maryland show yeah. she was a you know she was both in the film and on the set what was playing the same role so to speak Really, uh, Marilyn Monroe relied on Jane Russell. Right, Jane Russell was a rock, uh, and and had a kind of earthy or down to earth um, a sense of herself. Uh, and I think this came out even more later in life. But she was a religious person. Jane Russell. She had religious convictions, and I think she she grew up that way. Uh, and Hollywood was a kind of trial for her. And in later life, I tried to get to talk to her, and she was really reluctant to go back to that period of the of the the early fifties. Let alone, you know, the outlaw and Howard Hawks and all that business. Um, I think she had a great deal of difficulty with that. So I think her work ethic, her her probity, her sense of integrity, um, uh, was was really helpful uh, to Marilyn Monroe. And apparently there was no tension between the two women. I mean, Jen Russell was getting, a, you know, um, I forgot, quite a bit of money. Um, whereas Marilyn Monroe was still on a weekly salary uh, and, and was really play, paid a pittance, really, for her uh, her acting in, in Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. Um, and this was and the there movie that kind of yeah, like, go this ahead. was her breakout movie, right? Uh, for Marilyn Monroe? Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I think Niagara was the breakout role in the sense that it was her first huge starring CinemaScope, Niagara Falls, against Niagara Falls, so on. Uh, and it misfired in the sense of, I don't know, I can't remember box office receipts. I think it did okay. It misfired in the sense that she was, from the studio's point of view, not from her point of view or from the director's point of view, she was, you know, there was an evilness to her sexuality in Niagara. And they got a lot of that, and she got a lot of negative fan mail. Uh, and she wrote a very interesting uh, letter to the gossip columnist, Dorothy Kilgallen, which was published, Kilgallen published it, in which Marilyn Monroe said, because people were attacking her, that is Marilyn Monroe personally, uh, for being Rose Loomis, the character in the film. And Marilyn Monroe said, you have to understand. And she went through the different roles that she had played up to that point. You know, that these are all roles. You know, that's not me. Um, and, and, uh, and that's where Howard Hawks comes in with John for Blondes, because he said to Daryl Zanuck, he said, look, uh, you're, you know, you know, you shouldn't pa pass, you shouldn't cast her as a psychotic babysitter and don't bother to knock or a femme fatale in Niagara. Oh She's so you know. good in those movies. <laughs> yes, she is. Uh, but that's, that's what, in a <clears throat> sense, disappoint me, disappoints me about Hawk because he did value women and he did value the performance of female actresses, but he never, he really thought that Marilyn Monroe was goddamn dumb. And therefore, you have to find these sort of limited capacity roles, which you would do perfectly well in. But that's all she was. Uh, and don't think so. He, I think Hawks missed the boat on that. It didn't hurt him in Joan Ripper Blondes because of the kind of film it was. Mm. Or Monkey Business. She's good in Monkey Business, too, although it's a, it's a much um, uh, smaller role. Mm. It, has a one, it has that wonderful line where she plays uh, Cary Grant's secretary and she uh, hikes up her skirt, you know, and she's uh, fix, fixing, uh, fixing her nylons and she says to uh, Cary Grant, how do you like those acetates? <laughs> I think she's, she's also really good a year after this in River of No Return. Yeah. There are some aspects of the movie I don't like. For instance, there's basically a sexual assault that gets sort of swept under the rug uh, halfway through the movie, but um, she's she's great in it, and it's you know, and it's such a fun role. Also, I mean, there's no business like show business. Uh, uh, I think a couple of years after Gentlemen for Blondes, and it, it's just she's clearly just performing with one one hand tied behind her back. I mean, she's yeah. she's not <laughs> she's she even at like half her wattage or whatever, she was still stealing the movie. Yeah. Yeah, River of No Return is a really interesting film. I found that quite interesting when I was working on her biography because there are the scenes with Tommy Reddick with the young boy and the sort of the maternal motherly aspect comes out in her, just as it does in The Misfits when she has Montgomery Cliff's head in her lap. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's a kind of, there's the sexuality there, but, but there's, there's, a, there's a, another quality of her. And of course, she, that was one of the sadnesses of her life is that she could never be a mother. Oh, she and that, was in, she, sorry. She was physically incapable, or well, what happened was, and this was not understood at the time because these kinds of things were such private matters. Is she suffered from endometriosis, and she was in and out of the hospital for this condition, a very painful condition, uh, and it uh, with Miller it resulted in an ectopic pre pregnancy, for example. But because of who she was and the role she played. People just assumed that she was in the hospital for another abortion. Uh, and those weren't abortions. That was endometriosis, which was never dis discussed. We have her medical records. We know that that's true now. But uh, then it, it wasn't, people weren't aware of it at all. So they had a completely, you know, skewed sense of her. Mm. Interesting. And w was this the only time she performed with Jane Russell or no? Yeah, it's the only time she performed with Jane Russell. You've got that image there of her, you know, Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend, that very famous number from uh, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. Uh, she does sing. She does use her own voice. But, you know, there, there are notes in that performance that are dubbed that come in from another singer, uh, some of the very highest notes. She did record a couple of albums. She had a passable voice, not a tremendous voice, but she did work on her voice, her voice less, and she was a very hard worker all the time. 
uh, dancing and she wasn't a remarkable dancer. She wasn't a remarkable singer, but she really worked hard at it. And I think she was a remarkable actress, which helped with the singing and dancing. She sings and plays the guitar in River of No Return. And yeah. It doesn't, it didn't seem dubbed. I don't think it is. Yeah. I don't think it is. Well, that's, that's one up on Elvis, Ray, because like anytime you see Elvis <laughs> playing the guitar, that's definitely not <laughs> Elvis playing the guitar. And I, I've never heard any of Marilyn Monroe's records, but they, they got to be better than the dude. You ever heard the Jerry Lewis sings record where he's like trying to do Dean Martin, but like straight? Oh God. It's uh, it's bad. It's really bad. <laughs> it, it's interesting what uh, Carl said about uh, Jane Russell really being like that in real life uh, and, and them her being a good friend to Marilyn on the set. Cause we, we've been talking about the movie mostly in terms of uh, yeah, uh, the battle between the sexes or whatever, but it's mostly a movie about female friendship, which yeah. is really interesting yeah. and I think probably pretty rare. I assume that comes at least partially from the, the novel. Um, yes, it does, yeah. So I, I think that that's a really uh, interesting aspect. Also, the thing you mentioned about Jane Russell, uh, uh, I used to live in Los Angeles and, and towards the end of her life, she was doing something like, I think every Saturday night, she was doing a cabaret act at a hotel mm -hmm. in Santa Barbara. And what I had read that is if you went on the right night, she would uh, have enough drinks, she would tell any, she would spill all kinds of dirt about uh, hmm. <laughs> about Hollywood. Uh, sorry so, I missed that. I'm sorry I missed it too. It was only a couple hours drive, but uh, you know, it's pretty hard to convince my friends to go see Jane Russell at a, at a hotel. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I would have driven three hours to see somebody should talk Bob Hope. <laughs> Speaking of uh, Marilyn and musical, musical performances, one of the weirdest things that Ron, Ron and I watched every Marilyn Monroe movie, which I think is 31 movies, mm -hmm. uh, and we watched one of her earliest uh, roles where she had any kind of uh, yeah dialogue, and it's called Ladies of the Chorus. Chorus, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's actually a pretty fun movie uh, and not as retrograde as some of the other ones that she did. But she basically plays like a burlesque performer. And she has this very, and going back to Carl's observation about her childishness, she has this musical number called uh, Every Baby Needs a Dad, Dad, Daddy. And she's, yeah. and because of the production code, of course, it's not, she's not doing it very sexy or anything. She doesn't take off any clothes. But what she does do is bring these, these dolls out on stage to sing with. And it's incredibly weird. Uh, I mean, it's almost more weird than just doing a sexy performance. Uh, you can see that clip on YouTube, by the way. But actually, I, I think the movie is a lot of fun, too. Because yeah. it, it's one of those storylines that you, you see a lot with the showgirl stories where it's like the husband, uh, you know, the prospective husband uh, is scandalized by his wife's past or, you know, uh, by her profession or whatever, um, which mm -hmm. comes up a lot in these stories about showgirls uh, mm -hmm. or about female entertainers. Right. It's also in Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, right? The whole idea of not why would you marry that woman because she wants your money, but also the implication is that she's a, you know, she's a sex worker or she's a she's a stripper or something like that. Yeah, it's interesting. Ladies of the Chorus is a B movie. And I think uh, in the late 1940s up through almost to Niagara in 53, uh, you know, Monroe loses one contract at 20th Century Fox, for example. And I think she's thought of it best as a B-movie actress, not, not an A-movie actress. And really, an awful lot of women left Hollywood after three, four, five years of trying to make it. And she just kept going. Uh, it's quite remarkable between 46 and 52, uh, although she gets, you know, she gets a nice uh, small role in All About Eve and uh, The Asphalt Jungle. Um, it's, she's still not looked on as star material as, you know, someone who's going to break out into, you know, the studio is not, not grooming her. Uh, she had an agent, Johnny Hyde, very powerful William Morris agent, uh, who, who was pushing her career and saying she's going to be a big, big star. Uh, but again, that was discounted Well, he's having an affair with Marilyn and, you know, he's lost his sense of perspective and she's not going to go anywhere. Um, so it's it's uh, it's quite remarkable by the time we get to gentlemen prefer bronze. 
can you say anything about Clash by Night? Because this was one of the best movies uh, that she was in. Yeah. And she, and the I role she plays is there is not typical of her other roles. I mean. Yeah, she's she's uh, it's a it's directed by Fritz Lang and it's Barbara Stanwyck in it, Paul Douglas and Robert Ryan's wonderful cast, and she plays a fish cannery worker. Mm. and and uh and she's dressed in jeans still looking of course very sexy in jeans but i mean just listen to her voice in that picture it's it's not the breathy marilyn monroe voice and and marilyn monroe you know came from essentially working class background uh you know not well educated and so on uh and she's very gritty you know anyone you know if it hadn't you know if it happened today people would cast her in those roles again. You know, here it's a one-off, Clash by Night. It's a supporting role. Um, she does tremendously well. Does she get really any credit for it? No. Barbara Stanwyck, again, like Jane Russell, you know, is is very sympathetic. Um, uh, already by this point with Clash by Night, Mar Marilyn Monroe was sometimes showing up late. Fritz Lang, not known for coddling his actors and actresses, is really, really pissed off. Uh, but you know, you know, with Stanwyck's support, she she makes it through the through the movie. It's a lot of criticism, Marilyn. You know, she would bring acting coaches onto the set. First, it was Natasha Lightes, and then later in the career, it was Paula Strasberg. Well, if I was Marilyn Monroe, I'd want an ally too, because I can't depend on the studio. I can't depend on the director. Most people think of me as as just a, a you know a dumb blonde. So uh, I better have some artillery. I better have some weaponry. I better have something, uh, you know. So the directors are complaining because, you know, Monroe does a take and then she looks over at Natasha Lightis. Is it okay? It's set up at the director. So that's bad form, isn't it? That's not the way you're supposed to behave in Hollywood. But doesn't that look different today? Mm. Should we look at that somewhat differently? Uh, even Monroe's earliest biographers treated this as well. She really put these directors through the ringer. Well, yes, she did. Don't you think they put her through the ringer? Uh, you know, it, it's it's a very odd thing, but at yeah. the time, and that's an emotional weight on her too. Why is it always my fault? Yes, I'm late to the set. Why do you think I'm late? Because they're, you know, they're giving me these goofy lines that I know damn well aren't, you know, aren't any good or, or sometimes don't even match what the character could be saying. Yeah. So, yeah. I always point to Clash by Night as you don't think you you think Marilyn Monroe was was Lorelei. Take a look at Clash by Night. Mm -hmm. He's nothing like Nor Lorelei, right, right. and nor could someone with Lorelei's mentality possibly uh, play a fish cannery worker the way Monroe does in Clash by Night. Not possible. Yeah, and it's definitely she a second. fights with her boyfriend. You know, her boyfriend tries to push her around. She pushes back. Yeah, and it's definitely a, a sexist double standard, that whole thing about, uh, you know, uh, being a method actor or whatever, because, of course, she had nothing on Brando. I yeah, mean, yeah. Uh, exactly. I mean, she got she's worse and worse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's not yeah. the first actor, actress to hold up production or, you know, say, I, you know, this script doesn't work for me and so on. Sidney Skolsky said Marilyn Monroe knew more about what went into a Marilyn Monroe movie than anybody else. After all, she had to be there film after film. Directors come and go, producers come and go. Uh, but I got to be there and I got to do it. It's me. Uh, that's it. You know, it's it's my body that's at stake, my reputation that's that's on the line. Oh, it's interesting that a lot of what's coming out is you've got Hollywood very male dominated, but you've got a few um, women who are in some position, you know, who, who are in a stronger position. And there it's women helping out another woman, helping her succeed. That she might not and it, she might not have made it without without their uh, without their support. Yeah, I think it was really important. Yeah. The acting coaches were women. And uh, although ultimately her acting teacher was Lee Strasberg and and before that Michael Chekhov. Um, so she certainly had male help in Hollywood, but it weren't they weren't part of the uh, these, the, those men weren't part of the studio uh, production uh, system. It is a product, you know, and she's looked upon uh, as a product. You know, yeah. why can't you just hit your marks and say your lines? What, what is there? What are, what are you talking about? Why do you need to know about the motivation of your character? That's, that's, that's what's selling these movies. That's, that's the thing. She brings a kind of depth of interest and gravity 
to, to uh, Mailer, I think was really the first one to point this out in his biography of her, the devastating psychological impact it takes on a, an intelligent actress to constantly play dumb. Mm. I think that's very, very frustrating. Yeah. You also talked about the tension between her and Olivier with Prince and, uh, Prince and the Showgirl. And that movie is, uh, it's it, the movie's a failure, right? Yeah, in it is. Conventional yeah. sense. But it is a really fascinating movie to watch because yes. she's making completely different choices. I mean, he's almost like doing, uh, he's almost cartoonish in his performance. And she more or less approaches it from a really naturalistic uh, like uh, yeah. perspective, part of which is that she wants her character to make choices that make sense to her, right? Yeah. Uh, so he's doing this almost like Count Dracula routine. <laughs> and, and yeah, it's a, making, complete, it's, yeah. it's a complete mismatch. I mean, imagine if The Prince and Showgirl had been directed by Joshua Logan. You know, uh, Olivier made a show of consulting Joshua Logan, how should I treat Marilyn? And then he didn't take any of Logan's advice. Uh, he he didn't he didn't really he didn't see the point. Uh, it's the clothes and the makeup and learning the lines and being on time and all these other things about movie business that, that were important to Olivier and therefore Marilyn was just kind of tiresome. This American who you know uh, it wants wants to take this role and uh, of light comedy and 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 make something more in it. That's why we're still interested in her because she doesn't she doesn't do it by rote she doesn't do it by routine she's not Jane Mansfield although Jane Mansfield has her points too but mm -hmm. uh, there's only one Marilyn Monroe she really is inimitable and you could see this every time you you some actress attempts to be her it just doesn't work you, you know that she is inimitable I mean you can you can imitate her you can look like her but, but it's not her. Uh, and, I, like, and, to, and to people can up, see through that. Like to, to bring up Brando again, I think like the Monroe performances I I have seen, they're more interesting than Brando. Like the Brando stuff, a lot of it now just kind of comes across as like grunting. Like I think <laughs> James Dean did a much better job with the method than Brando did. Of, of course, mm -hmm. you know, Dean didn't. You know, Dean wasn't with us for very long, but. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, like Brando, I think he starts that kind of, I don't want to say like the negative side of method acting, but you start seeing that kind of Meryl Streep, like I need to emotionally dominate every scene I'm in mm -hmm. and kind of suck the air out of the room. I'm I'm not a huge Meryl Streep fan if that's not coming across, but like... <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like Monroe is actually at least like she's responding to people there's a sense that she's engaging with the people around her as opposed to kind of getting lost in this internal emotion of the character that a way that i think a lot of like like al pacino when al pacino goes completely off the rails like it's it's just sort of like here's here's just inner torment there don't need to be other people on the set there doesn't need to be a camera you could hear him like you know yelling hoo-ha probably from the next zip code well, it's, it's curious, screen, screen acting, which you bring up is really interesting about the screen acting because on the set, people like, say, Jack Lemmon in Some Like a Hot did see Marilyn as self-absorbed. They did see her as not interacting with them so much, uh, but she's, she's, she's doing something to the camera or in front of the camera that you know, can't be seen until you, you see it on the screen. There is some kind of magic going on there with actresses like Marilyn Monroe that isn't even a, a apparent uh, often to her fellow actors that this is true. Well, it's almost like like Fred Astaire, where the the camera is this like second acting partner. That needs yeah. To be engaged. Yeah, yeah. I wish that she had finished something's got to give, even though she was demoralized by having to do that kind of film again. Because if you look at the outtakes in her last film, there's a wonderful scene with Wally Cox. Uh, something's got to give is a remake of, um, do you remember the name of the film? It's uh, The Woman Who Returns from a Desert Island. Think of that, that, that movie with uh, Jack Nicholson and Diane Keaton, right? You know, it's earlier. There's an earlier film from the, from the 40s. Um, oh, I can't remember the name. The Wife Who, Re Who Returns. 
And at one point, you know, her husband is jealous uh, and uh, the, the fellows, uh, she brings on, she, she brings to the husband the fellow that she spent years with on the island, uh, except it's not, it's not him, it's somebody who's masquerading as him to try to prove to her husband that, that uh, nothing has gone on. And in Something Got to Give, Wally Cox is much funnier as, as this character who's playing a role uh, in, in, with, with um, uh, Marilyn Monroe and Dean Martin, who's playing Monroe's uh, uh, husband in, in Something's Got to Give. It's a, the chemistry between the two, they were friends, the chemistry between the two of them and, and uh, Wally Cox is sort of deadpan. Oh yeah, we know, you know, we, we just were friends on the island. <laughs> so <laughs> it's just, it's just hilarious. Man, yeah. uh, and the other thing is, I, it's always mystified me is um, George Cukor, who directed something God to give, who ended up ha hating Monroe, said that she was shot, you know, she couldn't act anymore. Anyway, we've got lots and lots of takes of, of several scenes from Something's Got to Give. And, you know, and also the, there's all this business about her blowing all her takes and Something's Got to Give. That's not what happens, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, in Some Like It Hot. In um, uh, Something's Got to Give, almost every scene she's on, you know, she's, she doesn't, she's not forgetting her lines. She's interacting with the children around the swimming pool. Um, she seems completely alert. Uh, so th that's always been a mystery to me, whether that was simply do you studio think warfare pushback, against her or what? I don't know. Do you think some of the pushback was resentment over the attention she got? I don't think it's so much the retention. She she became the scapegoat. You know, at the time mm -hmm. that she's making something Scott to give, the studio is spending millions and millions and millions on Cleopatra with Elizabeth Taylor. And, and Taylor was doing all the things that Monroe was doing in terms of, you know, uh, not showing up on or uh, delaying production, uh, making demands, and so on. Uh, and so it's like they've got to choose between Elizabeth Taylor and Marilyn Monroe, and they and then Monroe goes off to sing Happy Birthday to John Kennedy, which is their excuse because she she's you know she's left production to to do this thing in New York. She's flown from from Hollywood to New York, and so they they fire her uh, by the end of the summer. Uh, she, she uh, commits suicide in August, but by that time, the studio is renegotiating her contract. They realize they've just made an incredible blunder. I mean, they were only paying her $100,000 for the movie. I mean, that was nothing compared to what Elizabeth Taylor was getting for Cleopatra. So it's all just really, it's not that nothing is, it's not as if I'm excusing Monroe and nothing is her fault, but it's just in the sort of global context of things, it, 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 what the studio did was bizarre, mm. strange. Yeah, I just want to mention that, that something's got to give. There's like a 40 minute cut of it, like 35, 40 minutes long on YouTube that Ron and I watched. And Marilyn's very good in it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, there, yeah. there's, it's hard to tell if there was a good movie there based on what. Yeah, it might not have been a good movie. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah, it, yeah. The, the pacing is weird, but that could also be just. Let's put as much of this rare footage as we can in here. Um, yeah, yeah. But it also seemed there is this kind of sadness uh, in in the in the scenes with her and the children reuniting with the kids. Uh, yeah, in what is otherwise I think supposed to be kind of a comedy, right? Um, yeah, the original role was I still can't think of the name of the film. It was Irene Dunn. My favorite the wife. Monroe role. It was my, my favorite, favorite wife. wife. Yeah, yeah. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because the legacy of that that film, I mean, granted it was never released, but most of how I know that film is finding copies of that issue of Eros magazine all the time. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. thing, um, with the, the production stills. Um, I got it on the shelf over there somewhere, but yeah, it's, it's just sort of like, I, I think for a very long time, it was probably just remembered as like the naked Marilyn Monroe movie. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, it, it's it's really curious. I mean, to go back to Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, I don't know what, what, what her weight is in that film, but I would guess it's around 120, uh, at the most 125. And at the time of her death, she, she weighs, she had had a gallbladder operation, she went on a diet. Uh, she had one, one point ballooned up to almost 140. But at the time of her death, She's, she's back to the weight that she was when she was 19 years old. 
and in the costume shots where some something's about to give God, she's just so radiant. Uh, she just she just looks marvelous. So there, there's a lot there to her to her appeal and to the interesting about the trajectory of her life and you know the thoughts about what what she would have been if she had you know she's 36 when she dies she's gonna if she had lived she would have had to make some kind of transition in films uh certainly away from the, the kind of figure that she's playing in in gentlemen for blondes she continues in that vein a bit um we have mentioned this film how to marry a millionaire i know you've seen all the films you you've seen that one too uh, which I think is her, her comic timing in How to Marry a Millionaire is wonderful. And again, she's surrounded by Betty Grable and, and uh, Lauren Bacall as well, uh, which I think, uh, and, and Annette, there are a few, a few directors who really understand her. Henry Hathaway in Niagara is one of them. Uh, Ned Gulesco, uh in um, How to Marry a Millionaire, who had a tremendous interest in art and, and actually did production design Going back to the 30s, he did the story of Temple Drake based on Faulkner's novel, Sanctuary. Uh, and he and Monroe spent a lot of time talking about art and the history of art while, the, while they were making that film. So there are a lot of, there's a lot there in the way that she, in a sense, studies to present herself. Uh, that's, that's, that's behind the performances that people at the time, I think, took as just, well, that's her or it doesn't really take much to do that. You mentioned that a lot of actors sort of resented her or felt like they weren't engaging with her, but that she was sort of thinking about what, what things were gonna look like in the movie, like on, on yeah. camera. And I'm wondering if this kind of like, this, this sense that she had, like this kind of this radiance was uh, simply too bright sometimes. I was thinking about the fact that like, when we were trying to look for all of her performances, right? Um, and she was underused in a lot of her early uh, stuff. Mm -hmm. And the, the one that the, the green grass of Wyoming is the one where she's credited as being an extra in a square dance. And Ron mm -hmm. and I spent the better part of an hour going frame by frame through this square dance. And then I concluded maybe they cut her because she was too beautiful. Like maybe they yeah. actually cut her because she would distract people from the stars of the film. So I'm wondering to what degree could that have played a role is that just to, Marilyn was a, a very strong spice and uh, she was, you know, like also with Clash by Night. I mean, Barbara Stan Stanwyck is amazing, but if you give Marilyn a bigger role, then, uh, you know, uh, the balance is unsettled. And, and yeah, you know, I, I think there's something to that. And I, I think there's, there's a, that's a really interesting thought that you take someone with this radiance and if you're going to put them on screen at all, you're going to confine them, you're going to limit them. I think of her uh, as Miss Caswell in All About Eve, for example, uh, where she sort of led around by George Sanders, cynical George Sanders, who's given these wonderful lines, um, and she's again kind of kind of a kind of a dope um, from the Copacabana School of Acting, <laughs> as she's described in in All About Eve, uh, and that uh, the male dominated. The Hollywood conventions of the time uh, see her as being in those roles. And when she goes to the larger roles, uh, not just the producers or the directors, but maybe some of her fellow actors too, you're right, there's a, uh, there's a radiance there that they don't know what to do with and that is going to sort of put things out of whack in a way. I uh, hadn't quite thought of it in that, that context, but that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, and it, it's interesting when, when you were talking about that, I, I was thinking about like Robert Bursone on two fronts. Like number one, the fact she's engaging with the camera comes down to that like endless debate of what is the difference in the stage theater or in, in film theater. And then the other thing is like him purposely just refusing to work with anybody where the audience would actually know who they were because it was gonna distract from the movie. Mm. Um, I, I was also thinking you know, about playing to the camera as well. Um, before Monroe did any roles, um, she was discovered in an airplane factory and the fellow that was photographing her, Robert Conover, was the first one to suggest to her that she could be a model and perhaps even an actress. Mm -hmm. She was packing parachutes and spray planing, uh, planes 
um, it's one of the first drone factories actually in, in California. And she was working on it. Uh, and uh, that's all she needed to motivate her uh, uh, to, to go on to be an actress. But what she did with the, you know, the earliest photographers and right through to the end of her career is she would look at all the contact sheets she would look at all the photographs and she would talk to the photographer and she would say, what, you know, this seems to work, that doesn't work. What about this? Why don't you shoot this way? Or, you know, oh, that's interesting how we did this. She had that technical interest in photographs um, that, that I do, I think, suggest imply in my, my biography of her. That stood her in really good stead when she actually uh, came in front of motion picture cameras. And not all actors have that sense. Because again, a lot of them were surprised when they saw the rushes, when they thought she wasn't doing anything, and she was the one who was coming across. That 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 was kind of a, a revelation uh, to many of them. Um, she she really had that that uh, technical sense built in by the time she was uh, being photographed on screen. Yeah, and I, I think we spoke about this like probably more than 10 years ago at this point in, in one of your classes, but the uh, she seemed like a very pivotal figure in the kind of shift from from acting to this, this sort of like spectral thing beyond acting into a sort of iconography and that, that self-consciousness about the image production seems like, uh, like it, it, I, I don't want to say it was like a conscious endeavor, but she's thinking about it as more than just like here's a film, here's a film, which I, yeah. I don't know a, a huge amount about the, the biography, but I don't think like like Buster Keaton wasn't looking at it as like, what's the Buster Keaton brand beyond just me making this movie in this moment or, or something like, although I, I could be wrong. Well, again, if you go back to the, the you know, the, the shot you got here of uh, Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend from, from uh, Gentlemen for Blondes, She's not responsible for the choreography, choreography obviously, or the, or the direction. But I think she is very conscious of whether you want to call it the male gaze, how she's become sort of the center of attention and so on. Um, I think that's really um, a, a part of what makes her as an actress and what what makes her still, you know, fascinating to people is that that she she has that quality of, of fitting the frame, so to speak. And I think you can, you can see it there. It's also true in, with, uh, she's very close, very close collaboration with, with uh, Josh Logan on Bus Stop. And you get those opening scenes where she's framed in an open window, exhausted after one of her dance hall performances. And then you go into the dressing room with her. That's so, carefully um, framed, constructed, um, that, that's, that, that becomes really a part of her appeal. Yeah, maybe if we, we take this back to how we started by talking about gentlemen prefer blondes as having some kind of a female gaze, like what you're describing about Marilyn's uh, technical sense for how she would look and how things would look on camera probably comes from her own awareness of being looked at, right? Yeah, uh, and being very, very skillful at uh, anticipating the male gaze, and it, also if I think about the first time watching this movie, right, as a teenager, and thinking, well, she's performing within the world of the film, but part of what makes it funny and sexy and a bit strange is that she also seems to be winking to us. She also seems to be aware, and she never has to look in the camera, but she always seems to be aware that we're watching, um, and that's pretty unique. There's one other thing about that Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend scene that's accidental. It might have been quite different. Um, the original uh, design of the dress, uh, Billy Trevilla was the dress designer for Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. And originally he had a very sexy sequin kind of dress, almost the kind of dress that she wore when she sang Happy Birthday mm -hmm. to President Kennedy. But look at the dress that she's dressed in. It's much more elegant. Yeah. Uh, and it's like a, less like about a cool version of what uh, Rita Hayworth's wear, wearing in Gilda, right? Gilda, yes. It's a, it's a very different look 
she's got this kind of you know bow and tail which which makes her uh, almost you know kind of there's almost like an animalistic quality to it but at the same time it's kept within this this uh, aura of elegance at the same time it's again part of the sort of complex uh, many layered appeal uh, of a of a shot like this and you know partly she's moving but partly they are transporting her across this frame of film uh, as well so it, it's really the whole thing is really quite intricate Nat just disappeared into Maryland yeah <laughs> This is like one of those Homer Simpson disappearing into the bushes gifts almost that <laughs> <laughs> played over here. Like, uh... so we've been talking a lot about you know what a great actress she is and how much uh, you know how much more there is to her that you know how much of her image is claimed by her. But so she's a very good actor. We've had many great actors you know over the years. Uh, meanwhile, Marilyn Marilyn wasn't even nominated for any Academy Awards. And yet she transcends, you know, she transcends her role. She transcends just uh, being a great actress. Like what, what makes her different? Why, why over half a century later is she still larger than life? Well, people have tried to answer that question. There are a lot of answers to that question. What got me started on thinking about Monroe and my own background is I started as an actor long before I was, thought I'd be an academic. So I was really interested in how, how she made herself into an actress. But um, there's the, the thing about Marilyn Monroe uh, is, and th this is the one thing that, one of the things that Nor Norman Mailer really put uh, his mark on uh, her, her biography. And that is when he called her um, ambition Napoleonic. Hmm. In other words, she was really, out to capture the world's attention. If you look at her last interview with Richard Merriman, and she talks about being in Madison Square Garden, looking up at the audience, and you could see her shading her eyes in the film clips we have of her singing Birthday to the President. People focus a lot on she's singing Happy Birthday to the President, as they should. But if you look at her interview, what, what impresses her is the people that are there to see her and to see the event. And that she never, in the, in the interview, she's clearly saying, I have never lost attention, uh, focus on who my audience is, and that I'm playing for this audience. And I think, again, uh, it just really uh, completely oriented me, that one word that Mailer used, so many people dump on his biography, you know, it's sexist or, you know, whatever he's, you know, he's just drooling after her and it's, you know, the all kinds of things you can say against that book. But my God, he, he focused his, uh, his attention on her as an artist in a way that no one had done before. I had a big argument with a feminist historian uh, who's written a biography of Marilyn Monroe and she, she was at dinner one night was going out Lois Banner's her name she was she was going on about oh Mailer doesn't understand it. I said you tell me look at biography before Norman Mailer and after Norman Mailer and look at the way he uses that word Napoleonic and you tell me if he didn't change our orientation and how we look at Marilyn Monroe he just did so she was out to be that you know, she had a sense of the I future. I think Mailer would have had like a, a particular ability to access that because he always kind of was conceiving of himself in terms of his his quote unquote legend or, or like his public image as, as a. Absolutely. He actually says image. in his biography, put an artist on an artist. He did feel, I mean, it's a very arrogant thing to do, but he did identify with her in that way, uh, in a way that nobody before her coming along had done uh, and, and then you get things like Audrey uh, Flack's great photorealist painting based on a, a 1950 photograph of Monroe Jones Beach where again it's it's an artist's autobiography through the image of Marilyn Monroe it's quite astonishing it's, that's the cover of the first edition of my Monroe biography and it, I talked to Audrey about how she painted that, that, that picture so I, I think I think that's at least part of it. 
part of it is exactly what, um, uh, what's his name, who wrote about the Mona Lisa, had a huge impact on Oscar Wilde. Oh, you know, I'm reaching the age where the naming center is going. Um, <laughs> he, he, uh, he wrote on aesthetics, wrote Marius the Epicurean, a novel. Uh, as well as several works in aesthetics. Why can't I think of his name? You know, I remember the title of his book. At any rate, I'm not he says, I'm still forgetting. Yeah, what he says is that, you know, we can no longer look at the Mona Lisa and just look at the Mona Lisa. We, we through centuries of commentary and talking about it, we project all these kinds of things into the Mona Lisa. So a part of Marilyn Monroe is becoming an icon is what Marilyn Monroe did. But a part of it is this desire to have such a figure, to have such an icon. And at some level, she understood that, that, that people, people needed that. It's like, uh, you know, one of her great uh, heroes in history is Abraham Lincoln. Uh, there's this wonderful photograph that Milton Green took of her in a um, Cadillac convertible with the top down. And she's in the back seat standing up with this huge portrait of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, you know, and she was really attracted to this man of the people, this man who comes from nothing, you know, and who is both, uh, you know, uh, it's the Gettysburg Address, but it's also Abe Lincoln, the rail splitter. It's this, uh, the, it's the mythical figure. It's the hero who's a combination of things which ought not to exist in the same figure. It's, it's someone who's a combination of these contradictions that in real life ought not to be, maybe in literature, uh, maybe in art, but not in reality. And yet we have these figures. Uh, it's like George Washington going to the Second Continental Congress. He shows up in a uniform. He's the only delegate to the Continental Congress who shows up in a uniform. Uh, there's a very funny comment, in a recent George Washington biography by uh, David Stewart, who says, George Washington shows up just like, you know, someone with a gu guitar at a party, just waiting for someone to ask him to play a tune. <laughs> you know, it's like Washington won't admit that he wants to lead the, you know, the forces of the American Revolution. But that's damn, it's exactly what he wants to do. And he understands that this is his audience and that, you know, he's got to play the role. He's got to show up in the right uniform. It worked. It yeah. worked. It worked really well. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're still here. You know, the, the way that you're describing Marilyn's ambition uh, and also her iconicity really makes me think of Elvis Presley. And it's, it's, probably, yeah. it's probably notable that the two kind of iconic American pop culture figures are Elvis and, uh, and Marilyn. And there's a couple of things that I think are interesting uh, about their appeal that is similar. And probably there's also some biographical connection. But the, the first one is that that mixture, as you say, of things that that don't seem to naturally go together. So in both cases, there's this weird kind of childish innocence mixed with this kind of uh, aggressive sexuality, right? I mean, if you think about Elvis, like uh, those early appearances where he's shaking his hips, uh, which you know was a very overt, like, and, and also we should say appropriated from uh, blues culture, right? Yeah. Uh, maneuver, right? But then he also has this kind of like uh, mama's boy innocence. Um, and then when uh, I've read Peter Goralnik's biography of Elvis, you know, you learn that he was basically a, a mama's boy and that he had maybe an unhealthily close relationship there. And that, you know, he, he, he basically developed this kind of charisma where he could make anyone in the audience feel like he was singing just to them, you know. Mm -hmm. So he was always quite aware of what other people wanted from him. And the, the way people described uh, Elvis uh, interpersonally was that, you felt like you were the most important person in the world while he was talking to you. And I can't help but think there's something very similar in the way that Marilyn moved through the world and also the way that she thought about herself as a performer, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, also because of some thing that she lacked uh, from childhood, right? Or some, some thing that she wanted from childhood uh, that when turned on the public uh, created some kind of extra uh, charisma. I don't know if I'm articulating it well, but I really do see a connection between the, the two of them. The other thing too is, is Hollywood didn't let either of those, Elvis or Marilyn, to develop their full potential on screen. Mm -hmm. uh, Elvis, one film after another, just really, you know, 
probably the best. I haven't seen all the Elvis movies, but I, I think Love Me Tender, the first one, does show that he could do some acting. Uh, I once interviewed, it wasn't really supposed to be about Elvis. I was interviewing a screenwriter who had worked with Lillian Hellman for my Lillian Hellman biography. And he had written a film uh, for Elvis. And he said, it's really sad. He said, Elvis, Elvis was an actor and they didn't really allow him to, to uh, fulfill his potential. And I, I so that, that's something else about being an icon. Mm -hmm. I think in the in the enduring appeal is is there's this this identification with someone who, as great as they are, are denied certain things by the culture. That in a sense we come along afterwards and see those things in the figure that weren't so apparent at the time, and we again sort of um, uh, project into them. Uh, what is there, I think, but also something that we we invest with a certain kind of energy and perspective. Yeah, I, I think in U.S. culture, particularly, there's like this very heavy focus, at least in 20th century iconography, on like this mythology of like degraded or corrupted innocence, which I, I felt like I was reading something about Candide the other day, and apparently Candide, the, the only country where there was no pushback to it being published or circulated is the United States. And it was the, uh, it was the basis for the, uh, the Harvey Kurtzman Little Annie Fanny comics and Playboy, which I think is sort of like Candide meets Marilyn Monroe. There's just like <laughs> very acidic commentary on, cause like, you know, Kurtzman had had his, his sort of bitter dealings with the entertainment. Not, not quite on the scale that Monroe had, had had at that point, but um, yeah, there's there's something there, and, and yeah, Elvis too. I think like Elvis, people want him to be like godlike and childlike at the same time, so that they can sort of um, like they they can become an aspirational figure or a punching bag, depending on what side of the bed you woke up on. Well, or that they they allow us to tell a very conventional rise and fall narrative, right? Because mm. in both the cases of Elvis and uh, Marilyn, you have well, you know, they were at their peak, they were great, uh, and then they were they, maybe they were too bright, so you know, mm. or they were they were too big for this world, and then you get, of course, drugs and uh, you know, substance. right? They're like disciplined, they're, they're Icarus <clears throat> figures, and if they yeah. don't reach the Icarus phase, then we resent them for it. And in Elvis, you get this very clear, like, um, yeah, sort of binary thinking that young Elvis is the, the good Elvis, mm -hmm. and that uh, later period fat Elvis is, is the morally dissolute, corrupted mm. by fame, you know, all this kind of stuff. And I think there's a very similar thing going on with the way people talk about Marilyn. Uh, Which is weird, because in terms of Elvis, the records, the best stuff is in the middle, right? Like from Elvis in Memphis like the the comeback special illy that that's my favorite recorded elvis stuff but you're not going to convince me it gets better than the sun sessions so like uh yeah i mean elvis's comeback special is great like uh but it's great because it's a comeback special right uh, mm -hmm. it doesn't really you know i don't know if i'm gonna put on an elvis record it's usually from elvis in memphis though i don't know maybe that's just me but there's like it's something something just like very fundamentally appealing about that record to me like i love the sun session stuff don't get me wrong but there's i, I think he like comes into his own as a singer closer to the like, like the sun session stuff i think what appeals to me is he's, he's almost doing like a parody like there's a lot of like him kind of playing around with his voice in parts of that or at least that's the sense i get from it like in hound dog or something like that but i, I don't know yeah well there's a lot of experimentalism like it's yeah. just He's holding the material more loosely early on, and then from Elvis in Memphis, he's he's not afraid to just kind of go full like tragic or operatic mm. to be. And, and I, I guess the beauty of Elvis is is that uh, it's it's like he's like the Mona Lisa. You can everybody looks and can't tell if he's smiling or not. Or if I put on Elvis, it's I can't help falling in love mm. uh, at karaoke. <laughs> <laughs> Say if anyone, if anyone Elvis, you you transubstantiate. <laughs> I would say if anyone wants to hear Elvis with fresh ears, go back and listen to his earliest recordings of Blue Moon, mm -hmm. because this sounds like a, it sounds like a little boy crying. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, this is like the essence of Elvis.
As far as I'm concerned, there's just two Elvis songs. There's uh, Heartbreak and Desire. And as someone mm -hmm. pointed out to me, Desire is just another form of heartbreak in life. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Maybe that's the other thing is like the tragicness like in both of their, their personas, right? Because with Marilyn, it's like even when her characters are happy, they're kind of sad. <laughs> so that's another kind of like weird... Uh, two things that shouldn't be together that somehow are in, in her. Yeah, own. yeah, and I, I think like Marilyn, like one one of the the big appeals. And granted, I, you know, I'm I'm kind of I'm I I am not gay. I have not been, uh, you know, directly involved in queer culture. But at, at least from the cultural artifacts and the fossil record, it seems like a lot of that experience and a lot of the experience of being a woman. Uh, in this culture and probably in a lot of other cultures is this sort of feeling of being forced from moving from one performance to another in the sort of and I, I think Ryan and I were talking about this when we were talking about Rocky Horror Picture Show last, last episode but like this sense of moving from one stage to another with no actual ground under you um, and I think Mon Monroe like projects that or, or at least like embodies that um, much more I don't want to say maybe distinctly is the word I'm looking for, but like she she projects that in a way where it's not just uh, it's hard to boil down to just one take on it. Like it's not just sort of like cynical, like everything's phony bullshit kind of stuff. It's not quite like well, I, I guess it's hard to boil down, and that's why I'm having trouble with it. Well, it's interesting that that Carl said, and I agree that like. People have tried to do Marilyn and failed, but Marilyn has definitely echoed in popular culture. So I think mm -hmm. the most obvious example in pop music would be like Lana Del Rey, who in many ways is a kind of Marilyn type, you know, with all of those different things going on. Mm -hmm. And uh, in terms of film comedy, I would say Anna Faris uh, about 10, 15 years ago was doing the sort of sexy, funny thing, like, you know, where her characters on the surface seemed to uh, dumb, but were actually quite canny. Um, mm. And that that could have been a citation or it could have just been Ferris's own kind of version of that thing. But I do think it's there. Um, and I don't know if it's as simple as saying, you know, people are influenced by Marilyn or that it's a certain kind of uh, persona, you know. Yeah, and it's, it's almost like a supernatural force to be taken from like 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 i notice a lot of music videos they'll they'll take the background from the jailhouse rock video with with you know all the prisoners and stuff almost like it was religious iconography that they can they can be like okay i am i'm the thing that's going to piss off your parents now right like or they, maybe religious iconography wasn't the right metaphor there but it, it's you know it, it's a force beyond them that they're they're accessing through repetition of images or, or tones yeah i agree and well and also like if we were to follow the elvis example the most obvious like incarnation there would be eminem also right right in the, the yeah, of black music you know uh, a similar yeah kind well of he, he literally does that in at least two videos that i can think of yeah but he i think he raps about being his generation's elvis oh, yeah whatever. But of course, he actually, you know, gave credit to the people he was uh, borrowing from, yeah, in a way that Elvis didn't always do. So. Right. That that's sort of a. I, I think on most white rappers' first or second record, like like there's that great Edan record, Beauty and the Beat, and he's mostly just like talking about the history of hip hop through it. But but then he just has to drop in the middle of it. It's like a check your ass thing. Like every cracker that rap ain't the Elvis. Um, which goes back to there can be only one, right? Like, right, there can only be singular. Right, there's, there's Jesus, the Highlander, and Elvis. Yeah. Um, cool, so. so what's, uh, do, you, do, you, do you all, each of you have, well, Dan, this might be a little harder for you, <laughs> but do you have a favorite Marilyn performance? So not necessarily your favorite movie, but performance in the movie or character that she plays. Wait, I can only pick one? <laughs> So. All right, you you can pick as many as you want. That, From as Elvis the person, and Memphis. As the, as the person who doesn't have a favorite movie but has a list of top 17 so far, I'm the last person to say only <laughs> one. I mean, I think my my personal favorite Marilyn Monroe movie, she's not in it, it's that Bruce Conner movie. 
Oh, okay. Yeah, and yeah. The row look alike, and it's just sort of like going over it. it. I think it's just called Maryland Times Five. But that that's like a, a cheap cop out. A very provocative <laughs> choice, Dan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Give her no credit at all. <laughs> yeah, say the, well, the I'm role. I'm leaving space for you guys. Oh, the, so I'll, I'll just say the the role that I like her best in. Um, it's not one of my favorite of her movies, but it's, uh, oh shoot, now I can't remember the name, uh, uh, The River. River of No Return. River of No Return. Yeah, yeah, and there's something about that performance. Um, I think it's the first one that we saw in which she wasn't uh, the, the blonde bombshell. And I was like, wait, what's going on here? This isn't Marilyn Monroe. You know, where's this sort of three-dimensional human performance coming from? And there's, this, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, there's the sweet, you know the the motherly scene and her playing guitar in just sort of very soothing way and um, so so part of it was that it was it was unexpected when I first saw it so so it might be tied to that but part of it was the the near three dimensionally dimensionality of it. It's hard to choose. Um, my favorite scene, the one I'd like to, I often talked about uh, when I gave talks when I give talks about Marilyn Monroe or classes uh, and I deal with this scene in my book too is from the seven year itch appearances when she's uh, coming down the steps uh, in this apartment with Tom Yule who's this uh, fellow middle-aged guy who's fantasizing about having an affair with her mm -hmm. and she's unnailed uh, the, what's what separates the two apartments so that she can come down this stairway and she's got this she's got this hammer in her hand and she's coming down the steps. And his main attraction, Tom Yule, is the fact that he has an air conditioner and it's really hot in New York in the summertime. And he sent this family away to enjoy the summer while he works at a publisher. And she's coming down the steps and uh, he, he, she, she looks at him with this hammer in her hand. And she says, you know, we could do this every night. And as she says, we can do this. Every, and, and she says in the most innocent way possible, like a little girl with the, the hammer almost as a kind of tool, kind of play thing. And after she says, we can do this every night, her eyes narrow. And, and if you look at that scene, there's that sexual innuendo just in the narrowing of her eyes, which shows what she could do as an actress uh, with a scene like that. Uh, I could watch that over and over again. It is so tremendous. I'm sure most audiences, they took it in, but if you're a connoisseur of acting, take a look at that. And I, I, I guess my like serious answer is, is my favorite is probably gentlemen prefer blondes. <laughs> yeah, that's why I said it's probably the hardest for you or easiest. I guess I'm, easiest. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna cheat. Uh, Gentlemen prefer blondes is obviously my favorite Marilyn performance. One of my favorite movies, um, and I would say it's very hard to choose uh, when a movie like The Misfits is also in that filmography because it's such a different role and it it is such a clear indication of what could have been uh, with Marilyn's career. So like I think those are her my two favorite roles of hers. Now, in terms of movies that people haven't seen very much of, I would absolutely recommend Don't Bother to Knock, where she plays a, a psychotic babysitter um, for, for an early role where you can really see her potential. And then, yeah, I, I think Niagara is one of her great roles and also just a really fun movie. And it's interesting that people talk about her being the femme fatale in Niagara because even her take on the femme fatale is kind of, has some innocence to it, right? Um, mm -hmm. and it's just, it's a, it's a great performance and it's, it's a gorgeous movie. I mean, it's, there are very few noirs that look that good. So, look that colorful. What's the name of the movie that takes place in an apartment complex or that's all about the apartment uh, building? Love Nest. Love Nest. So, not a very big role for her. Um, and this isn't about the role. I really like that movie. And that's a movie that I never would have seen uh, if not for us watching all these Marilyn Monroe movies. So I think that's, uh, that was high on my list, definitely, if I had to pick favorite movies. Well, clearly, I have some homework to do. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, oh, I misspoke, too. She was in another, I, did Hawks direct 
all of the segments of that? Oh, no. So Hawks didn't. Okay. So she was also in O'Henry's Full House. Oh, yes. Yeah. But she wasn't in the Hawks segment, which is really the only good segment in that movie, I think. So. That's the one I least remember. Yeah. It's not a testament to the to the quality of the movie. That's just she, my she was really good in that uh, that Andy Warhol screen print. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I, I think that that kind of relates to the discussion. I think, I think Warhol had like a an intuitive understanding of a lot of the celebrity culture stuff before most people did. But but I can say that my <clears throat> introduction to Marilyn recently reintroduction was all about Eve uh, and. Now that Ron and I have embarked on a new project watching Betty Davis filmography, mm. I really would have loved to see Marilyn and Betty in a more substantial pairing. Uh, mm, I think yeah. that would have been a really interesting combination. I'm not sure Betty or either one of them would have allowed it, but uh, I think it would have been. Well, imagine if Marilyn Monroe had, had played the Eve character in All About Eve. I'm, I'm imagining Marilyn. Not a possibility? Whatever happened to Baby Jane. I say in my biography, it's a possibility because there, there are parallels between the way Eve acts in the movie and, and what, what Marilyn was up to in her early years in Hollywood. I think she would have understood the character. Mm -hmm. whether, whether she would have been acceptable to others, that, that's a whole other issue. Yeah. I'm trying to imagine her. That's why I'm kind of looking off. Marilyn Monroe and Paul Verhoeven showgirls. <laughs> well, it is interesting. You could just look at the, I mean, she worked with John Huston on Asphalt Jungle in a nothing role. And then like, it wasn't, you know, it was a relatively short period of time before she played in another movie of his, right? And uh, I think he didn't take her at all seriously in Asphalt Jungle. And then, you know, she was the, uh, she was uh, like the whole point of the Misfits. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I remember when I saw Asphalt Jungle, I read later that it was Marilyn Monroe. I didn't even realize it was Marilyn Monroe when mm -hmm. I was watching it. Although I, I saw that a long, long time ago. How do you not realize you're looking at Marilyn Monroe? <laughs> I, was, I was young and stupid. You've been looking at the Warhol counterfeits for too long. <laughs> right, right. I, I was uh, I was expecting her to look a bit more Canal Street. Dan was hoping for more Jane Russell. I was like, is that a can, yeah, yeah, Jane soup can or is that is that Marilyn Monroe? <laughs> Well, does she's anyone? A, she's, a, she's a brunette in that movie, right? In what? In, in, in Asphalt Jungle, she's a brunette. No, no, she's no. a blonde. What movie am I? She's thinking? a blonde, definitely a blonde. A blonde who has had a more more mortal line about saying, "Don't bother me, you big banana head." <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, I'm. Uh, yeah, man, I I I may have. Uh, so we. As you said, you have some homework to do, guys, huh? Yeah. You've got a lot of movies to catch up on, Dan. Well, I got to watch them again because, like, I clearly did not pick up on everything when I was in college and I was just watching, like, three movies a day. It, well, you know, if there's any movie that you're going to go to and watch now, um, it, it's the scene, the every baby needs a dad, dad, daddy. Did I get it right? Well, you sent me that on YouTube. I've oh, seen I did? Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right, so you're all set, really. The, the rest of that film is a hoot. By the yeah. way, this is Phil Carlson. It, you know, in my in my Sylvia Plath biography, in discussing her film Daddy, I bring in everybody needs a dad, dad, daddy. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, people thought I was crazy, but I don't think so. It's a great scene. Does anyone have more thoughts on Marilyn Monroe or Jane Russell? Oh, or don't, don't get me started. <laughs> oh, wait, on Jane what's, Russell? What's your favorite Jane Russell performance? Yeah. To be honest, there, there's a lot of Jane Russell I haven't seen, so I'm hesitating. You know, I, I can't yeah, speak yeah. with authority about what what the best one is. Um, you know, she did a cu curious western with Dana Andrews. I'm trying to think of the title. I write about it briefly in my Dana Andrews biography. Um, this was in the 50s. I can't remember, but it certainly wasn't. It wouldn't rank as anybody's favorite. I don't think. Uh, Johnny Reno. Yes, Johnny Reno. Okay. I think I've only ever seen, I saw two Jane Russell movies and I saw them both on the same night. <laughs> I saw this and I saw Son of Pale Face. And this oh, is- Oh, right, right. We watched the Blinds movie. is definitely the better movie. Yeah. Although I would argue that Jane Russell is far and away the best part of Son of Pale Face. Yes. Um, yeah, we watched that as a double feature, a somewhat unfortunate double feature. 
I don't know. I didn't mind Son of Pale Fate. Like it's Frank Tashel, and you you know it, it's not going to be terrible, but like it it I prefer Tashlin with Jerry Lewis. Mm-hmm. But you know I'm I'm like the I'm the Jerry Lewis apologist in the room. <laughs> Lisa Carl, did we not talk about Jane Russell enough? I mean, the focus was on Marilyn Monroe, but no, I, thought I guess we... Jane, Jane Russell. If you're single, call me. <laughs> Uh, Jane Russell with Robert Mitchum and Macau. Mm. That's a film I really liked. Mm. Directed by Nicholas Ray and Joseph von Sternberg. I mean, that's quite a oh, wow. quite a combination. Yeah, not as good as that combination should suggest, but it's a uh, it's, yeah, it's a fun one. <laughs> now I'm quickly looking up Jane Russell movies to see if there's any others I could think of because I'll say I, I really liked her in Gentlemen Prefer Belongs. Yeah, she's good. Well, well, shall we? Yeah, so uh been a pleasure. Yeah, and where where can everybody find you guys and your your projects and your your stuff you're up to? They can just go to carlrollison.com. And and Matt, uh for Cinema of the Damned uh for our screenings and stuff that are online, go to damn cinema, d a m cinema.nl as in the Netherlands or check me out on Twitter at Matt Cornell. All right, cool. And if you don't know where you are, uh, if you want to get back to the Anomaly Questionable Movies page, just uh, stay here, I guess. So uh, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm still Dan. And I'm still Ron. And today we've had on uh, Carl Rollison and Matt Cornell. Thanks for coming on, guys. And uh, hopefully we can, uh, we can do this again sometime. Yeah, it's great having you on both individually thank you. and together. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Good. It gets me to shut up every once in a while. Yeah, yeah. All uh, right. We'll take care. Right. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.